What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome back to Bunk Bed Breakdowns. This is Big Dogs' exclusive Dynasty show where we're covering everything Dynasty week in and week out for y'all. Today, we are talking about a subject that I don't think gets talked about enough because naturally analysts that do Dynasty shows pretend like they're really good all the time. But listen, every once in a while, you take over a shitty orphan team or things don't go as planned. So you have to enter what we call the rebuild mode. If your team is, you know, you could be sitting in purgatory where you're not really in that playoff hunt yet, but you're not the worst team in the league. Sometimes for, to, to get from point A to point B, from where you are to the championship, you have to go to roads untraveled, which is point C, then up to point A. I don't know what I'm talking about anymore, but we're talking about rebuilding a dynasty. And we're going over everything you should do and should not do. The do's and don'ts of rebuilding your team in dynasty if you are stuck in the middle or your team is just very, very shitty right now and you're not really sure the direction to go how to sell picks what picks to go for what players are optimal to move you know based on age things like that we're going to take a look at some of the rosters that you guys sent to us on our discord channel if you are not a part of our discord channel that thing is fucking popping i think we're over uh, around 15 or 1600 members in there we've got over 40 startup leagues popping off already and i expect that number to hit triple digits by the time like midsummer rolls around so you guys have ever wanted to get into dynasty this is the spot to do it we will put the link in the description we'll put the link in the comments let's talk about rebuilding this is something that both of these guys know way more than i do because i'm not typically in the rebuild mode i know mike over there is just fucking taking l's left and right in his league so he's got tons and tons of experience when it comes to shitty dynasty teams how are we doing boys uh i'm doing well but nick i think you forgot one very important thing to do well, listen, I wanted to introduce you and welcome you before we hit the intro, you fucking asshole. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just scarred from all the times during the actual season where I start to talk and you just hit the intro over me. So, Well, now you do the editing. It. So you, you're, this is, you know, you're allowed to hit the intro whenever you want. You should, you should bully the new person. So now that Mike is the new guy on the block, you should be like talking to him mid-sentence and then hit the intro. <laughs> That's fair. So, Mike, we're going to start off. What do you consider a rebuild? Well... All right, let's hit the intro. <laughs> How did you not see that coming? <laughs> Damn it. Um, are we actually going to kick it off? Yeah. All right. We'll I'm start. Down with to just, I'm down to end the episode right there. <laughs> yeah, I think we're good. I think we hit the peak, guys. Black screen for an hour. All right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah um, Mike, look, you can kick it off. What do you consider a rebuild? Look, there's a very there's different stages of rebuild. Okay, there is like the rebuild where you are in a fucking absolute toxic relationship where you just gotta like cut all ties. You know, kick everyone out the door. You know, don't talk to their cousins. Don't talk to their friends. <laughs> Everybody in your team is gone. Okay. Love that them. is the rebuild where you're where you're like you're basically fucked and you are on a two to three year plan to rebuild yourself uh you know you're questioning your existence why you're, you're working playing. on yourself you know was it a, <laughs> yeah. was it a you thing was it a me thing you yeah know? <laughs> uh chances are it was probably a you think because you fucked up the team so but the good news is you can have a path to get there um and then there's the other rebuild where look maybe you need to take a little bit of a break uh, you just, it just not significant other. You just don't, you're not excited to see them in the morning. When you wake Mike, up you're turning to Colin you know? Coward with all these like marriage and, yeah. and stuff. once you draft a quarterback, you're now married. You're living with them. Their little bad habits can wear teammates out. I, yes. I like where this yes. is going. This relates yeah. to a lot of people. Yeah. Yeah. Like, look, you're just, you know, you, you know, you want to be with that person, but just not the right time. So you take a little bit of time apart, you know, you stop talking to most of their friends, but the real close ones, you still hang by. And that's where you take like a specific core, you punt a lot of the noise, a lot of the, you know, things that you didn't need in your life and you build around those key assets. So that's also rebuild. So there's different tiers to this. I like the first one, the scorched earth. I think that's the most fun, mainly because you don't even have to pretend like you're going to be good uh, for a couple of years. You can take that first couple of weeks and scarf down a couple of donuts, you know, drink a 12 pack of beer and, and then work on yourself a little bit later. But that's the one that I like. So there's different stages of this. There's definitely different types of rebuilds to do. Yeah, I think it completely depends on like who you are as a person. Like my pockets aren't deep enough to punt three years. Like I probably won't get my money back anyways, but like I actually want to try to compete. But 
Um, I'm in a situation right now where Yannick was generous enough to pay my buy-in, and I took over a team that had Derek Carr and Phillip Rivers as my quarterbacks, and like Karrion Johnson as my RB1, so I kind of have to go scorched earth, and it's going to be a tough road ahead, but if you have that mindset that you're building for two to three years out instead of trying to be competitive right now with a bunch of frauds in your starting lineup, it's going to be a lot easier. Like You have to look at your team and yourself in the mirror and say, this is going to be a long haul, and you just got to be in for the ride. Yeah. Um, I think one of the interesting questions is like, there are people who start leagues immediately and they're like, we're in future mode. Right. <laughs> and they, they draft accordingly based on the fact that they want to win two or three years down the road. Now I'm, you know, when do you can start, when do you start considering a rebuild? Is it like, it's almost like, you know, like all of us right now with our hairs, it's like, you don't notice you need a rebuild. You don't notice you need a haircut until everyone already noticed it like five weeks. Like you're still holding on to some of those key players. You're like, no, my team is good. I swear to God, like it's, it's just bad lighting. You know what I mean? A couple things broke the wrong way. And then you realize you need a rebuild. I'm one of those people that I don't think I'll like, it takes me a long time to give up on shit, you know? So I will, I will try and try and try. Like if I could slip into the playoffs and, tr you know, get lucky and try to win a championship one way or another, I'm that way. Uh, Mike, I feel like you have a very targeted approach. You're just like, Okay, you're like analytically minded, number minded. You're like, I, I need to be in, in rebuild mode, time to sell my best assets. Yeah. Uh, when, it's do you, a, when do you know? Uh, so basically, I take an assessment of my players like in the offseason, like right now, my teams. But to give you an example, I had a team with like Joe Mixon, Kamara, Devontae Adams, um, George Kittle. This is a tight end premium league. Um, dare I say Joe Mixon? And then I had like TJ Hawkinson. So a great core of assets, right? But I, knew, I took a look at the other teams in the league, and this dude had, like, CMC, Lamar Jackson. I'm just like, okay, look, my quarterbacks are trash. There's no way I'm going to compete here. So I'll probably, like, you know, crawl my way into the playoffs, but I'm not going to win. So to me, like, if you're not first, you're last, and I'm only trying to win. And the longer you drag it out, the less value some of those key assets have. So you kind of want to try and sell at the peak. And, like, if you're a fringe playoff team, if you look at if you look at your league and every roster and you're not confident that you're going to be one a lock for playoffs and two you have like a great shot at making the finals that's time for rebuild to me. I think uh, actually the league that we're in together Mike that you won back to back and you beat me in the championship last year. I don't know if did you see the trade that I made yesterday or two days yeah, ago? Yeah, I did. It was a great trade. I yeah, so it. I so I moved Stefan Diggs. He originally offered me Deontay Johnson uh a second round pick and and Tyrell Williams for Stefan Diggs and I countered with the same thing same players uh Tyrell and Deontay Johnson but I moved the second up to the first yeah. and I kind of thought of it the way you did I I felt like I kind of lucked I mean my team was good last year but I felt yeah. like I kind of lucked into the championship game against you like your team was way more stacked than I was and I don't think that'll happen again this year so I was like okay I'm gonna move Diggs because his value is very high I don't think he's really gonna be that big of a, a key contributor like he'll put up like what like 12 points a game maybe this year that's not gonna be what pushes me to the championship game so I'm like let me get a first next year I needed more depth on my on my roster behind like running backs let me get a guy like Deontay Johnson who I really like who might be two or three years away from really like breaking out but that's the way yeah I'm I'm, I'm kind of I guess in the same boat with you but I tread the line a little bit more I don't dive in one way or the other I always want to compete just because it's fantasy and like yeah. you don't want to have teams where you're just like oh, I know I'm not ever going to compete and like one lucky break and kind of take yeah. you out of the thing but like I, I think it's a fine line between looking towards the future and completely just like I guess like tanking in a sense yeah I, I think like you know the one trap phrase that I hear all too often is like all you got to do is get in the playoffs like all you got to do is get in the playoffs yeah <laughs> no no that's not how it works uh like if you're in the if you're in the NBA like Portland Trailblazers not a good place to be you know you're gonna get in the playoffs but you're just gonna get fucking smashed so you don't want to be that in uh, fantasy especially because like most leagues are top heavy prize payouts um, i was gonna that's say that's like that's that's very common in dynasty leagues because there's no, it's almost like no it's like no salary cap in some sports where in a dynasty league there are always people who have played a lot and have a lot of experience and there are people who aren't and those people always get taken advantage of with, which leads to like very lopsided teams you know so like there tends to be if you are in that like sixth place kind of like purgatory role whoever's in first or second probably is an absolutely stacked team. Cause if you're just experienced whatsoever, like you, you probably built a team that just smashes the rest of the league. So that, that's a very common thing in, in dynasty. I'd say. Yeah. I also think a good time to rebuild is always try to do it a year before it's too late. Right. You always want to be yeah. one year early to the party than one year late. Like the trade that Nick made, right. Say Stefan Diggs goes out this year, you know, the whole coronavirus, he doesn't have a chance to work with Josh Allen. He puts up like 950 yards or just a thousand yards He's a year older. He's on a new team, and we see him maybe not succeed in year one. That's just another year out of his prime, and he got a better return this year than he would have next year, especially with a guy like Deontay Johnson who's super young. 
Uh, so if you have a guy like Zach Ertz, even in a tight end premium league, who's going to give you a ton of value, if you don't see yourself as a playoff team, you might as well sell him now because you're probably not going to be a playoff team next year again. And the value of you trading him next year is going to be a lot less than what it is this year. Yep, exactly. Yeah, I, w- I would say that like you look like an er- Ertz is a great example of that. Like we, we a lot of people talk about like the age apex for players. I think, you know, if the age apex for running backs is like 26 years old, you want to have you want to if you're in rebuild mode, you want to sell those. I don't care if it's like Derrick Henry or Aaron Jones. By the time your team is rebuilt, those guys are going to be 28, 29 years old. They're not going to be doing shit for your fantasy team. So if the age apex for wide receivers is like, you know, like DeAndre Hopkins is a is a really good piece to move right now if you're in rebuild, because by the time your team is competing two or three years, he's going to be past that 30 age mark. So the urges, the D hops, no matter even if they're in their prime right now, you get the value of their prime via trades. Yeah, exactly. And those players aren't going to help you win, right? Like when you're in a rebuild, you don't want studs because studs don't increase in value. And this kind of rolls into the next question. You know, people talk about what positions do you focus on? Uh, What I focus on is this. I only invest in high likelihood increasing assets. So number one, that's draft picks. Draft picks never decrease in value. So in your example, you kind of traded digs who may or may go up, but he also may go down. But the the first you got, there's a 0% chance that that goes down. It's always going to go up. So that's how I like I really think about things. Like if I'm buying something, maybe I sell for a discount, but that's okay because the thing that I'm getting back is increasing in value. The thing that I'm selling away, in this case, DeAndre Hopkins, is going to at best stay flat, but most likely decline, right? So you want, you want to get some upside. You want like a lot of players to upside versus one player that's really good. I also think if you're on the clock at like the 101 or 102 and JT or CEH are staring you in the face, but you know good and well that your team probably doesn't have a chance to compete for the next two to three years, it might be a smarter investment to just trade that pick back, acquire picks in the future, and maybe go for a receiver that likely has a higher or longer um, active window for them to be able to contribute to your team. So although you're passing up on like an elite running back, the chances of that running back actually giving you the value that you think the 102 would give you is extremely low because you want to try to optimize your win now window. And if that's just not the case, it's probably a smarter move to acquire more assets instead. Yeah. I also think I think there's something to be said for the specific players, especially in this year's draft class, because for the most part, none of them are going to hit their peak value in year one, right? Taylor's going to be competing yep. with Max. Swift is going to be competing with Carry On. So, like maybe typically, you look you look at the guys you draft differently, right? Like this year, you might take Acres over Swift. You might like Acres more as a player, but if you're rebuilding. I would say there's a very, very high likelihood that Swift has more value than Acres in like three years. You know what I mean? So look at it that way as well. Like don't the first year that you're going to have a player is not important whatsoever if you're in rebuild mode because again, you're not really competing. So I think looking at them specifically. So I'm not necessarily going to uh, throw away the running backs, but like if they're if if the peak of their value is going to be that first year, then maybe it's it's worth moving back for or not taking that player as opposed to someone else who might actually be ranked a little bit higher. Yeah, exactly. Um, and that kind of rolls into the next question. Like someone, you know, always I get asked, like, can you do a rebuild from the startup? And what I'll say is this, I never go into a startup intending to lose. I'm always intending to win. But there are, if there are opportunities that present itself, there are very rare instances where I will pivot and say, look, I'm just punting your one because everyone's reaching hardcore for like running backs and everyone's selling their first round picks. And you also got to think about like the rookie class. So I would say this year is not a good year to punt year one because the running back class coming in next year is not good. I did this strategy last year, knowing that the 2020 class was going to be an incredible running back class. So in the startup, I traded back like so many times and just acquired a bunch of picks, not knowing where those picks would land up, but you know, I ended up getting like four or five of them. So I had a good shot at getting one or two at the top. Cause that's a key, right? Like people always say like, Oh, draft wide receivers. You can always replenish through the rookie draft. That's just fucking false because you need like a top pick. And if you yeah. draft a bunch of good wide receivers, you're not going to be a bottom pick. Like you need to like spread the wealth and like try and like get other people's picks. The guys are trading up because if they get an injury, that's like the one-on-one pick right? You're going to land a running back. You're not going to just fix your running back with one rookie pick that you got at like 1.05. That's not going to happen. Yeah. yeah I think I'm, the I, only way you can really try to rebuild from a startup, if that's your plan is you can like trade your first round pick for like a third, fourth and fifth. And then your second round pick for like a fourth and a sixth. And then as you stack those picks, maybe use a third or fourth on a running back. Cause Mike said like outside of Najee Harris, Hubbard and Travis Etienne next year, it's a pretty weak class. Obviously guys like CEH kind of break out in one year and become the one one which could happen next year. But just looking as it is now, like try to invest in maybe a Miles Sanders or an Austin Eckler around that range and then use your mid-round picks to maybe package like a seventh 
for a 2021 first and a 10th round pick because some teams that are in win now might completely devalue their next year's first round pick because they, you know, seven rounds in, you might say, oh, look, I just got Robert Woods in, in the sixth or seventh round. The rest of my team is stacked. I'm going to be the 112 next year. This pick means nothing to me. When in reality, if those teams are giving up a lot of depth to be able to move up, if one of those guys gets hurt, that 2021 first can easily move to like a 106, 108 and get you a lot better return than you may have expected, especially if you're not planning to win, right? You can kind of punt that seventh round or eighth round pick this year in order to get like a 10th rounder this year and then also a first uh, in the following rookie draft. Yeah, I, th I think like uh, it might be counterintuitive, but I think if like if you're in a league and you, you know, you've played fantasy for, or dynasty for a long time and you understand the value of trading, if you're like the best dynasty player in that league or like one of the top ones, it, it almost actually makes sense not to punt your one, but to get it to extract as much value through the startup draft as you can, because people uh, that aren't experienced have, have very, very uh, weird views of how things should be valued within startup drafts. So you might end up punting your one but only because, you know, you were offering your seventh round startup pick for someone whose team kind of is shitty already for their first round pick or something. So you might end I like my, uh, my roommate Wilson was like trying to start off. He texted me the other day and he's like, yo, uh, he was asking me questions about dynasty and he's never played in a league. He's just like a very typical, like season long guy. Right. Mm -hmm. And which is, which is why I was like, okay, this dynasty thing, like definitely has some traction. This was the first time I was like, yo, dynasty is going to be massive. So he was like, yeah, me and my friends are like looking to get uh, a league together. And he was asking me a bunch of questions. He's like, do, does it like not matter if you trade away all your like your future picks in the in the in the startup draft or whatever? I was like, no, that's like a massive problem. It's that's too much happen. animal. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a massive problem that's going to happen in in like newer, less experienced startup drafts because like I don't know, most people I guess enter dynasty leagues. You should be looking at it as a long term play, but a lot of people, you know, if this is just human. It's just human uh, mentality. You look at things from a short term view, especially just like the society we live in. Everyone wants things now, 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 now. And dynasty, if you play the long term game, you're almost always going to come out on top because patience, patience typically wins. Dynasty people are looking to get that like that quick high, so you could sell for shitty, uh, shitty startup picks for future first round picks. So if you are more experienced, maybe maybe don't look to dominate the startup draft. Maybe look to dominate all those like future assets. I think that's that's definitely yeah. a strategy worth looking into. But I definitely don't go into the startup draft like, yeah, I'm just gonna punt this and then yeah, um, and then try to do better later. But if the value presents itself, that's when I would take advantage of it. Yeah, exactly. Um, that rolls people, well into the next question. When is the cheapest time to acquire rookie picks? And Mike, I know you harp on it, but during the start draft, it's so easy to get like first or seconds as throw-ins. And then if you acquire a ton of seconds, like 2021 20, seconds, using those as throw-ins to future deals when their value is much higher than it is at the time you acquired it, is it's a good way to be able to move from like a mid second round pick to, you know, a late first by packaging two seconds, right? So uh, Mike, I know you hit it on, on hit on it a lot, but like, what are some deals you could throw out there to get rookie picks and startup drafts? Yeah, so the the money spot and the reason why we want you to trade out of the first and even the second round, to be honest with you, is to accumulate picks from three to five because that's the money spot where you get first. People are actually like not willing to give up first in the early round. So you'll find that like, if, hey, I'll give you my uh, I'll give you my one point oh one for like one point one ten and your future first. They'll be like, no, fuck that. Even though like the value is technically there. They just can't like mentally get behind the concept of jumping 10 spots, even though it's totally relevant, right? But when you get to like the third or fourth and you're sitting there on the clock at the fourth round and there's like Q a QB run hits, right? Someone's like, oh, I'll give you my sixth round or my seventh round plus a first to get to that fourth. That is like the most common trade and the best money spot to get rookie first from what I found because by then they have already committed because they've already invested in a bunch of top assets. Like, yo, I'm a master fucking drafter, master of the universe. I'm going to win this league. My first is going to be late. I don't give a shit. I need a QB. I'm going to jump up. Whereas in the beginning, nobody knows. Everyone's like unsure. You know, it's kind of like, it's kind of like you're in like a speed dating. I was like, oh, like, hi, like my name's Mike. Uh, you know, uh, this is what I do. Whereas later, like my name's Mike on a big fucking dick. Like, come on, <laughs> let's do it. Right. So that's like the difference between early and early and middle. Yeah, there's a lot of value to be had in startups. I think two other spots that I would say are like best, best case scenario. Like, okay, so for instance, if you own a guy like DeAndre Hopkins, uh, what I would probably do, well, depending on, you know, what you're getting offered now, but I think the single best time to trade a guy like that is when you're further into the actual in season, depending on when your trade deadline is. By like week 10, you know who's a playoff team, you know who the contenders are, and you know who isn't. And if you're rebuilding, you're not one of them. So you go to the top five teams and say, listen, DeAndre Hopkins is going to push you over the edge to win this championship. 
give me your first this year, give me your first next year. That's two, that's two first round picks. DeAndre Hopkins was literally doing nothing but rotting on your team anyways, because he's not helping you compete. So you look to do it when you know how the playoff situation is shaping mm -hmm. up, look for the guys who's your piece, your high value piece fits their roster and will push them over the edge. It's the easiest thing. Cause honestly, a lot of people, when they try to trade, they always try to like win the trade in, a, in an instance like that, both sides are winning. So it's super, super easy to get that deal done. Right? Like you'll sell off your first, if that, if you know, that's going to push you to the championship, right? You yeah. don't feel like you're losing that trade at all. Both sides feel like they're winning. So that's easy. I think also during the rookie drafts, right? If you're already into it, if you're rebuilding, you probably have a lot of picks already. So if you're sitting there at like the 208, you can move back to maybe like the 212 and pick up next year's third round pick or next year's second round pick or something like that. It's very easy like that. It's very like simple math. Moving back, it, it's just like you see in the NFL draft when teams move back from like early third round to late third round plus yeah. pick up an extra fifth round pick. That's yeah. the way that you look at it. It's very small incremental moves that add up over time. If you do that like three or four times, you'll look at the next year and be like, oh, fuck, I got an extra second, two extra thirds, and you'll be able to package those things up to move up, you know, two thirds, two seconds for a first round pick, you know, and those, that's the way you got to think about it. That, that last point is like so important. And I'll, you know, people always say, and I say it too, like, oh, like third round picks and fourth round picks are worthless. And if you're a contender, they are. But what, what happens is you cannot view them as a pick. Like I, the, the amount of times I make a pick using a third round or a fourth round pick is like next to like nothing because what it does give you is it gives you an anchor into that draft. It's easier to trade up from a spot than it is to trade in. Like when you're in the draft, Nobody wants to fucking trade out. I promise you this. Like, even if you're in the second round, third round, doesn't matter. Everyone, like, has rookie fever. They think they're going to hit, like, the next Antonio Brown. But if you have a pick in the draft already, the more spots you have in it, the more maneuverability, the more flexibility you have to move yeah, up. Yeah, no one wants to give up a pick for, like, just a straight-up player. Like, everyone's yeah. like, ah, no, we want the new exciting thing. Yeah. So that, that's like a very important concept. So don't devalue those third round picks. Like Noah said, like Nick said, like get as many of them as you can. You can use them as ammo. You can use them to trade up. You can use them as value plugs for people that love trade calculators. And like, well, this trade doesn't let me win. Throw them like a second round pick or a third round pick. It doesn't matter in the big scheme of things. Yeah. yeah so my rookie draft this year, I made a trade with like a completely rebuilding team that just wants as many darts as he can get. I traded the 405 to the 407. So three picks and I moved up to, I think the 302 and I chose Antonio Gibson. <laughs> so like those picks kind of do hold value, especially if you're in, team, yeah. in leagues with teams that want to have a lot of darts to throw at a bunch of different players. And I was trying to trade for Antonio Gibson since like the 208. So the fact that I could get him like six spots later and only have to give up what I perceive to be like taxi squad stashes or guys I'm going to cut after year one. Um, as Mike said, and as Nick said, it's like a huge value to be able to get them as throw-ins and then in later deals, uh, use them to help you move up in drafts. Yeah, I, I would say also if you're in a very new league, like if it's your first year, like you and your friends just got together, did a league, they're going to devalue the third and fourth round rookie picks and just throw them away. No one's going to understand the value until you've actually been through the rookie draft and they're on the clock and they're like, fuck, I wish I had a pick so I could take mm -hmm. this guy. So if you're going to be maneuvering around a lot of like third and fourth round picks, I would say start that in year two if people haven't played Dynasty because they're not going to actually know what the, what the values and, and things are for that. Yeah. Let's talk about like the, the future though in terms of like how long uh, a – you know, turnaround should take. And with that in mind, like, are we trying to accumulate as many next year picks uh, as possible? Are we trying to accumulate two years out? Like what, what's your thought process on that? Yeah. So uh, trying to acquire the rookie picks in the year, like after a season is like the worst idea because those yeah. picks are always highest value at the time. So I was acquiring 2020 picks in like 2019, uh, like, like before the 2019 season even started, I was acquiring 2020 picks in my rebuilds. And I was like getting as many of them as I can from whoever I could. doesn't matter what I thought about their team because like people, like you said, people want reward now. Like nobody is thinking about two years out until the season is done and they have nothing to think about. So right. it, like when you're, when you're trying to buy stuff for cheap, like this is the best time to buy. It. And that's why I say like, it kind of ties into the other question is like, how much of a loss are you willing to take on a trade? Like I'm willing to take a loss in a rebuild because I would rather get something that's has a potential to rise and hold something that's just like going to die on my roster. Yeah. You know and I, mean? I fall victim to this too. When I see like a 2022 first in a deal and I'm giving it up, I'm like, Oh, who fucking cares? A year is probably not even going to happen. And then a year from now, that 2022 first means as much to me as a 2021 first means to me right now, which is pretty heavy because I know after the season, it's going to carry a lot of value. If you're rebuilding for two to three years out and you're acquiring 2022 firsts and 2022 seconds right now, it might seem like you're not getting a ton, but if you're not planning on competing this year, then a year from now, you're getting a ton of ROI because I'd be willing to bet that in a startup, if you're able to trade your 2022s, 
you could probably get one for like a 13th or 14th round pick and people in that range are just complete dart throws like Tony Pollard is probably around that range and he's not like the biggest dart throw but when you consider that two years from now you can get like a top end receiver for what is a handcuff running back and you're not even going to start that guy because you're not competing then it's a huge win uh by doing that type of trade yeah I think like most things you could be a very good dynasty player or at least do a very quick and efficient rebuild if you're just logical like if you don't take the fact that you want short-term wins into effect no one else does that. So as long as you're like, if you just use complete logic and not emotion behind the deals you make and the way you're building your roster, you'll be able to do it. But Dynasty, again, it's just long-term play that people have so much trouble. This is, Dynasty is legit like the anatomy of like the human brain and whether or not people can successfully do it. If you could separate emotion from logic, you'll be able to do a rebuild very, very, very efficiently and very quickly. Yeah, I'd venture to say in most leagues, there are probably only like two to three teams that are rebuilding when there should probably be like four to five to six teams rebuilding. And because of that, like Nick said, you get a playoff of other people's uh, ability to think that they're better than everybody else and make the playoffs Mm -hmm. and get lucky. Like you can acquire a ton of value because other people aren't doing what you're doing and taking Mm -hmm. advantage of the time frame that you know you're going to eventually be able to compete in. Yeah, exactly. But the one goal of getting future picks is whatever year is what I do is I pick a year. Okay. Whether it's right now, if that's 2022, fine. If that's 2021, that's also fine. But I pick a year and I try and get as many picks in that year as possible. And I try and dominate that draft because like, that's how you become a very quick turnaround versus Mm -hmm. getting like two picks here, two picks there. Like when you dominate, when you control a draft, you can control the value, whether it's people trading in with vets or people trading up and down because you are the only person they can come to. Right. That's how I was able to turn around a team so quickly in one of my rebuilds because I just owned like five of the top six picks and half the second round. So like whatever you do, like pick a year and just go after that year. Like you might not know who the prospects are yet, but I promise you there's talent every single year. Uh, next year might not be as good as this year, but there'll still be enough. So just make sure you pick a year and stockpile picks in that year. Imagine yeah, you could, the 2017 draft and getting like McCaffrey, Leonard Fournette, Alvin Kamara, Juju, and just like having yeah. the entire first round, like you'd be in a win now window for like six years at that point, other than Leonard Fournette, cause he kind of stinks. <laughs> yeah. And like the other thing is like, you give yourself a lot of flexibility. Um, you give yourself a lot of flexibility when you own like an entire draft, because what you don't have to do is take only rookies. Like how we were talking about yeah. how no one wants to trade out. Like you could start piecing together your team. Like, you know, if say you have like one or two good assets this year, but you had a lot of the 20, uh, 20, firsts, right. You draft like Jonathan Taylor, you get like Cam Akers, maybe J, JK Dobbins or whatever. And you're sitting there at the, like the 108, 109, but those two keys, key pieces you already had were like Juju and maybe like a, another young wide receiver. You don't need to waste that pick. Like you could always trade that 108 or 109 for like someone, you know, like Kirk Cousins or some, some shit like that. Right. And that solidifies your quarterback one spot. And that's how you could do a quick turnaround. You don't always have to use all the picks that you have. You can be the one that trades the picks for the players and like Bill, you know, you mix and match what you want to do with rookies and vets by owning an entire draft. Yeah. Well, uh, I'll link you the Twitter thread, but this is like exactly what I'm talking about where I had a league. I own the 1.04, one to 1.04 and the 1.06 and then three times seconds. So traded out the 1.01, got Mixon, uh, drafted Taylor at the 1.02, traded out the 1.03, added a second to get Kamara, right? And then drafted CH at 1.04. So my running back core went from, uh, I literally only had Mike Boone uh, for, for the entire time. <laughs> I had Mike Boone easy. and Matt Breda, who I traded, to Alvin Kamara, Joe Mixon, Jonathan Taylor, Clyde Edwards are there in one year. So That's but you have an absurd. <laughs> but you have to control the draft to do it because let's say you just have the 101, you just have the 103. Like you're you're trying to make a choice between like drafting a rookie and and getting a vet. And that's a very hard choice for people to make. Like even for me, I'm like, I don't want to fucking give up Jonathan Taylor. But when you have multiple, you want to balance the risk profile. You want to get the vets because people want to trade in. And if they want to trade in, you're the only one they can go to. And that's like a really important concept. It's just supply yeah. and demand, supply and demand. So in terms of, yeah. And so in terms just overall of like, you know, how long should it take or whatever? I like Mike's idea of, you know, picking a year and dominating picks based on that year. Cause you give yourself a lot of flexibility and leverage once you get to that draft. So the other questions we were, when to acquire rookie picks, when are they the cheapest? We kind of went over that startup drafts in rookie drafts, moving back. And then right before like the trade deadline, when you know who's a playoff contender, how do you determine who's old? Uh, I would say like if you think someone's getting to the age where they're going to be old, you know, maybe like a year out from being old or players that, you know, like the T.Y. Hiltons who are like still going to be good, but they're on a one year contract. They're not going to get a massive contract the following year. Like you need to get out a year prior to them to when you think they're old. 
Yeah, I, I need to. Yeah, that that's the concept there. Is like it's not a production age because like wide receivers will produce the most probably from like twenty eight to thirty. So the guys like Julio are still producing. It's when the public perception of that right. player is old and you can no longer trade them. So Nuke is right on the border right now. Adams will be there next year. Keenan Allen will be there next year. Uh, like usually, like a, a simple rule of thumb is you don't want to think about all that stuff. You should not own any players on your team that are that are older than twenty five because that gives you like the two to three year window to do whatever you want before the, anyone hits an age effect, whether it's running backs, wide receivers. Um, that's kind of how I think about it. Like on my rebuild teams, I don't have a single player that's over 25 when the draft season starts. That's that, make, that makes strategy. sense. I try to trade him Mike Evans. He's like, oh, he's 25. He might be 26 one day. And then in four years, he'll be 30. So he's not going to help my team at all. I'm like, God damn, Scott. Like- <laughs> no, but that, that's so true, though, because things change so rapidly in fantasy. Like, before you know it, you know, Mike Evans, you might think is a, as a rebuilding piece because he's 25, 26. But in a year, we're going to be like, oh, shit, he's, you know, he's getting up there. There's like this whole contract thing. And they bring yeah. in, you know, one or two things quickly change in an outlook and then the value just fucking plummets and before you know it he's old and his his window for trading is is just out the window so it's like you have to uh you have to do everything before you think you need to do things is yeah. nick terry mclaurin's gonna be 25 this year <laughs> that's prime that's peak you want him on all your yeah, but next year he's falling off a cliff uh, he came in late he's got no tread on the tires <laughs> uh, adam thielen's got 10 years in the tank then yeah. Well, one more thing we should cover is like th- what position groups to focus on. I know that's a question that people have. Like I, like I just said, like I just, I most, for the most part, I don't even have running backs on my roster. If I know I'm going into a deep rebuild, like I'm selling all of them. Uh, even if they're like, even if they're like young, if they're like 22, 23, I'm still selling them because in by two years when I'm actually like ready to compete, I'll be able to buy back either them for cheaper or I will be able to draft rookies. So that's kind of how I go. That's how I go. I plug in everywhere else first. So if it's a super flex, you want to solve the quarterback position with a couple of young players uh, that have potential. And then uh, it, something that I do that I don't think most people do is I focus on tight end. Like I like to lock down a tight end in my re- in my dynasty because tight ends have a very long uh, cliff in terms of like their production they produce well into their 30s so those two are the two longest producing assets and then i get like a nice wide receiver core and i plug running backs like last uh that's kind of how i do it i don't know how you guys do it no that makes sense because the windows close so quickly on running backs so it's like you can't you can't plan for a a production window from a running back two years out so that's what makes it so difficult with them with wide receivers we know that they last for much longer and you could tell when a guy is like super young if he's going to be a thing for a while right like if you were rebuilding and you grab the dj Moore who's like 23 years old like you don't have to worry about selling him and hitting his fucking peak age apex or whatever because he's going to be a staple of your team for like eight years so i kind of like that i never um I, I guess tight end was never like a focus for me around fantasy teams but now that i think about it most of the teams that i have success with in dynasty are always uh, ones that have like really really solid tight ends yeah i also think a good time to buy receivers if you are rebuilding is after year one because so many of these guys struggle and i know 2019 was sort of an anomaly seeing like aj brown dk metcalf Debo, and all those guys produce but like if you think back to like every single year right there's always those guys that don't do anything as a rookie and then they break out whether it's tyler boyd or michael gallup didn't even have that great of a rookie year or dj chark right they just weren't in situations to produce then year two and year three they just completely break out and you could have acquired them for such a cheap price I know this past year, like, you don't want to buy Andy Isabella or J.J. Arcega Whiteside or any of those guys because they did absolutely nothing. But for the price you get you, to acquire but them you for. Do, though. But you do, though. I, yeah. J.J. Arcega Whiteside, <laughs> dude, I'll send a first for him. I'll send two firsts. <laughs> no, no, but your point is valid. Like, you want to – you want all, all the guys that came in with, like, identical production profiles, some of them are going to do really well in their first year. Some of them are not. But the ones that don't doesn't necessarily mean that they're never going to be a thing because it takes – long for wide receivers typically to break out like Nikhil Harry I think is a fucking phenomenal piece to buy if you're in a rebuild mode right now you know yeah and the thing is like to buy Nikhil Harry what's it going to cost you a mid-second that's what like a Brian Edwards or Brandon Ayuk who we probably don't expect to produce any more than Nikhil Harry did in his rookie year so you just get Mm -hmm. to completely fade the rookie year slump and get the sophomore season out of Nikhil Harry in return so uh, that's the strategy I like to deploy in uh, acquiring young pieces and as Mike said like running backs you want them on their rookie deals Obviously, the elite of the elite guys get extended and they continue to produce. But, like, honestly, if you're completely rebuilding and you have a chance to grab Jonathan Taylor, like, the chances of him being valuable to your team and your team competing in the next four years is probably not that high. So it's it might not be the smartest thing to pick him. And I think I said it earlier in the video, but just, like, trade that pick and acquire more in the future so you can acquire a running back when you are actually ready to compete. Mike, what are you smirking at? <laughs> Nothing. Just, just type in the coach. 
<laughs> uh, oh well i guess i guess one topic we should talk about is uh you know tanking because it kind of goes hand in hand with rebuild and we've already talked about the legit way to do it and another reason why you don't want to hold running backs on your team is because they score a lot of points and if you hold your own rookie picks uh you kind of want to lose so the legit way to do it is to sell off players for assets and that's like a that's like a common way to do it and tanking is legit you should be allowed to tank just just do it a legitimate way yeah, I also think another uh, important topic Scott brought up, it's how to approach rebuilds in, in active leagues. Now, hopefully all the Discord leagues, people are making trades like crazy, but some people are in leagues that have lasted for like five to 10 years and somehow they're still around even though people aren't trading. It's, it's kind of tough, but I, what I would say is like people that are afraid to trade don't want to not trade. They're just afraid to lose a trade. And I think in that sense, you have to kind of be willing to lose a trade where you know it helps you in the future. So like for example, if you really believe in Terry McLaurin, like one of us three does, and you have Julio <laughs> Jones on your roster, you know, you know you're rebuilding. That's really gonna fade Terry this year. Huh? <laughs> I'm really not fading. Gonna do this. No, no, I'm not fading Terry. Yeah, I don't like his analytical Ooh. profile, but uh, you can trade like a Julio Jones for a Terry McLaurin and like a third round pick. And although that doesn't help you at all this year, maybe even next year, although I would argue that they're probably gonna be a lot closer than many people think, um, in public perception, you're probably losing that trade. But it also opens the door for you to make future trades. And you also get to play into the future because Terry McLaurin's obviously like five or six years younger than Julio Jones and has a longer window to produce, maybe not at the same height. But, you know, losing a trade isn't always a bad thing, especially when it can open up the floodgates for your league to become a little bit more active. And honestly, keeping the league active is what's going to keep it around, right? So that's I mean, I chances are if you're rebuilding, you're going to lose like 80 to 90% of the trades you're doing. Um, and that's totally <laughs> fine because... You're going to lose in the moment. How did you misspell Terry? <laughs> <laughs> you're you're, you're uh, going to lose in the moment, but... Uh, T-E-R-R-Y? No, the first time. Oh, no. I just realized I wrote it too small. I didn't think you guys... <laughs> <were close. laughs> but I crossed it out and rewrote it. I was like, fuck, that I really just misspelled Terry. <laughs> T-E-R-I. Um, uh, yeah, what was I saying? Oh, yeah. So, like, you look, you can lose. There, there's losing trades, like, in the moment doesn't matter i can tell you that right now i lose trades in the moment all the time i will send out if people like trade calculators i will send out trades where i lose every single time like nine times out of ten because i'm making a bet on a player or an asset that's going into the future so don't even worry about losing especially if you're gonna rebuild if a trade calculator tells you you lost fuck that trade calculator do the trade anyways because Problem hours. Won. Yeah. <laughs> yeah exactly so it's incredible it's incredible yeah like looking back on trades that happened that you thought were like no like the whole league actually i'm uh, in the go fade me dynasty league there are trade i don't think we've had one trade where people are like wow what a fair trade i think every <laughs> trade is like oh my god he just got fucking raped in that trade and every time you look back you're like wow that was kind of like a ridiculous trade and half the time it works out where it was what we said half the time it was like it didn't come out that way i remember like two years ago I needed an RB, uh, like a, a high-end RB to compete with. And this was the beginning of last year when David Johnson was like super hype. And I traded Scott in, in the league that you and me are in together. I got David Johnson. I gave up Christian Kirk and a first round pick. And at the time, everyone was like, oh my God, that was like the worst trade ever for Scott, right? Because I was getting like a top five running back in David Johnson. And he was going to help me compete for a championship. Fast forward one year later, and then also prior to DeAndre Hopkins coming, whatever, you're like, Wow. David Johnson is dead. He has Christian Kirk and my first round pick now. What a win. And now you're looking at it like, ah, I don't even fucking know anymore. You know what I mean? It <laughs> yeah. just goes to, goes to show that like over two year span, we can't predict shit that's going to happen this weekend. We can't predict shit that's going to happen over a year. So to think that you can correctly predict something that's going to happen over the course of three years is fucking asinine. Yeah, that's crazy. All right. I, I think wish that's uh... just like delete all the trades you made in the past because I've been looking <laughs> back and seeing some of them. Like I traded away Allen Robinson for like Marquise Brown, Chase Edmonds, and Jay Sternberger in like the 18th round of a startup, and I thought it was a good deal. And now I look back and like, God damn, I would much rather have a Rob than these three frauds that are never going to see the field for me. Yeah, I traded away uh, Austin Eckler before the start of the last season. That's your first mistake. You should have never done for, that. Yeah, huge <laughs> mistake. Huge mistake. Uh, I gave Austin Eckler in a third, I think, to get Chris Herndon in a start two tight end. Tight end. No <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That was probably my That's worst incredible. trade. Ever. <laughs> worst trade ever. I still managed to win that league somehow because I had Barkley right. Cook. I had Barkley Cook, Chubb, and like a bunch of running backs. But I could have had Austin Eckler as my, my RB like my RB four or five going into the year when he finished as a top. Dude, that's insane. <laughs> I got fucking Chris Herndon who didn't start a single game. Chris Herndon, man, I'm old enough to remember him. That's ridiculous. All right. Uh, hold on. All right. So 
Uh, we could sit here all day and talk about all the bad moves Mike has made in his life, <laughs> but we need to to provide more value to y'all. So we're going to jump into uh, one or two of the rosters that, again, you guys sent via Discord. If you want to join the Discord channel, get all feedback from other people within the community, that will be linked uh, below. So Noah, who do we got first and, and what's this roster looking like? All right, we got the best Knicks player of all time, Patience Jeremy Lin. And his team is just the most rebuilding team I've ever seen in my life. His starting lineup, he has Cam Newton and Brian Hoyer at quarterback. And I'll put all the pictures of the roster on screen. The only players of note he really has, I would say, are Deontay Johnson, A.J. Brown. And then his taxi squad is loaded with uh, Joe Burrow, Antonio Gibson, Henry Ruggs, Jalen Rager, and Jerry Judy. But he does have four 2021 firsts. Um, How I would approach this is... By the looks of it, if you have your own 2021 first, you're likely going to be the 101 or the 102, which means you're going to get Trevor Lawrence or Justin Fields, which is definitely going to help you out. And the fact that you acquired a bunch of wide receivers, I think is super smart because if you were to go out and get running backs, it would kind of be wasted on this team. And I know you kind of have Kerryon Johnson slotted in there. Although he probably won't return you the value that he's going to be worth to you, um, like points-wise week after week, it's not going to be worth trading. I think with the roster you have, you you should be able to take a loss on that trade and get him, like get a late second round pick for him. Um, but on top of that, right, you have Rob Gronkowski on your bench and he's somebody who I'm personally not that high on, especially with the team that you have. Like I think a perfect time to sell him rather than in season because there's a huge risk of him just not being good at football as he yeah, wasn't the last time. I said, yeah, you sell him right now. Yeah, you sell him right now because if he does step in and he's not even as good as OJ Howard and he's in a system that doesn't really use tight ends that much, you can get a lot more in return right now than in season if he does end up being a dud. And then another player would actually try to go out and sell is Matt Breida, but he's somebody I'd more so wait for in season because he's like sneaky older. He's like 25 or 26, and he's also somebody that's not going to help you maybe get a second round pick and then in the future use those seconds to move into the first uh, and build a running back uh, core in the future by doing that. Yeah, I think you kind of nailed nailed it on the head there. Like Gronk is a guy that you sell off. And some of these guys you might end up losing profit on. Like Gronk, obviously you have no fucking use for Gronk. So getting like a third round pick or something for him is fine. Carry on, same thing. Uh, Cam Newton is an interesting one because I think there's someone in your league that will give pretty good value for, for Cam in a super flex league. What are your guys' thoughts on what to do with Cam right now? Like do you hold, hold out and wait? Hold, hold, yep. You hold? Hold, yeah. I if well I mean if if I'm so so if you're a him you would hold him right now and yes. wait for him to land on a team as opposed yes. to because Cam came out and said that he would be okay being a backup somewhere. That's fine. That's fine then because if he's a backup, you're I mean you're still, depending on where he goes, you can still get a second for a backup, right? Uh, because he's like a pretty good player. Like he's not gonna he's not gonna go back up like uh, you know Russell Wilson, right? Like if he backs nah. up someone, he'll be like, go to like Pittsburgh like, or some shit, probably. Yeah, exactly. And people will still have hope, and you can still sell for a late second. But if he gets a starting job, it's an automatic first. So the downside upside uh, risk there is. I, w- I would go shop him for a first right now. I would just go send Cam for a first to everybody and see if anyone fucking bites on it. If not, obviously you hold. See if he lands with a team. If he does land with a team that he's going to be the starter for, then you flip him for a first. If he doesn't, then you wait the furthest you possibly can into the season uh, to you know to close the gap on where his value is going to be for next year and try to save. But any of these older guys you get rid of. Uh, there was another player I feel like I saw in here that was probably worth getting rid of. Yeah, Matt Breda was definitely a good pick. I would say like what Mike said before is you kind of try to dominate the one draft. And you have a lot of good young pieces that I think are probably like two or three years away. But between Cam – uh, Gronk and carry on, you should be able to pile on a couple extra, um, like mid round picks there. And yeah. then you're sitting with like eight picks for, for next year that I think would be, uh, good to turn around the yeah. roster you I, have. I think this team's in a good position. I would say you're probably in a three, three year window, maybe. Um, so what do you guys think about, what do you guys think about like, uh, Tony Pollard, uh, and Madison? I think go he should be to, selling them, yeah. To the, go to the to Zeke the owner and go to the Dalvin Cook owner and sell those two players for maybe seconds, like early seconds if you can, something like that. Go, go see what kind of market they have for the for the person that owns the the, the starters in that respective offense. Because if I'm in Dynasty, like I'll like I I have um, a lot of the reason I have like Eckler in places was because I had Melvin Gordon. I drafted Melvin Gordon last year and I was like I'll, I want Eckler like regardless of whether or not I think he's a good player. I actually value – I don't value handcuffs and redraft, but I do value them in Dynasty, right? Because mm-hmm. you need to have that RB slot filled uh, for the long term, and that kind of guarantees that you'll have it done. So I think uh, you will get some good value out of trying to move Pollard or Madison to 
uh, to the right team. Even if you need to throw in Madison and Mike Boone, if the person's like really yeah. worried about Dalvin Cook in the situation, yeah. throw him in for an early second and see if you can get that back for it. Yeah, or like something like uh, Pollard plus Gronk. I mean, if the team has Zeke, I'd imagine they're probably trying to compete this year. Yeah, uh, you can throw in Gronk and Pollard in a package and get like a second and a third or something would be pretty realistic. And I would say, like I said, I was, I think your team is probably on a two to three, three probably a three year window if I had to guess. So what you're going to do is like try and get some more of these, uh, the 2021 picks. And when you're in that 2021 draft, like you're not going to immediately turn those team around. So what you're going to be able to do is flip some of those firsts for like, you know, a later first plus a 2022 first or something like that. You need, you need more darts here uh, than less, but you have the core to build around, right? You have, you have AJ Brown, you have Joe Burrow, uh, Jalen Rager, uh, and uh, Henry Ruggs. And then you also have Jordan Love and Jalen Hurts, who I really like for your team, actually. Uh, you kind and of Trevor Lawrence, too. That's like a really good core to yeah. build around. And that perfectly fits what we said earlier in the video, that like these quarterbacks and receivers have such long windows to produce that, yeah. you know, in the future, you punt on running backs now to get them in the future. So their rookie contract matches up with Jalen Rager and Jerry Judy in their prime. So... Yeah, that's definitely a good way to think about it, Mike, is, you know, go for Trevor Lawrence next year if he's not available. And even if, you know, Justin Fields falls to you out of value, go for him and then punt the rest of your rookie picks for future picks uh, yeah. that you can acquire more value for. And then you'll be able to stack more running backs than you would if you just spent them early on in the 2021 draft. Yeah, the way you always got to look at it is one man's trash, another man's treasure. You know, like that, that's that's a real ass statement in Dynasty because people's teams fit. Like, are, they're in such different trajectories. So, team players that don't fit your roster will – you'll find someone whose roster does fit. All right, so the second team we're going to dive into is – or the 1991 Denver Broncos, I guess, is an Animals Burner account. But this team, <laughs> I think, is a little bit too good to be Animals Burner account. Um, he has a 12-team PPR super flex roster, and we will put the roster – on the screen i haven't looked through it so you guys can kind of take this away for right now while I do yeah it. so this is like uh this is like probably one of those ones where it's not a full like scorched earth rebuild you know it's kind of like one of those middling teams that that really doesn't have enough to push you over the edge but has a lot of good pieces in place so he's got kyler murray and baker mayfield as his two starting quarterbacks so great start two young quarterbacks uh long window he's got deandre swift uh, Will Fuller, Terry McLaurin, Henry Ruggs, and Jalen Rager. So again, just like very young wide receiver core led by Terry McLaurin. Uh, great start. You got Henry Ruggs and Jalen Rager pulling up the rookies. And then the problem, the reason why this team is probably not a competitor is because the bench is just a total wasteland. You don't have any depth behind these starter players. So, you know, that's kind of why I think this is a rebuild. But you do have a bunch of picks. You have two 2021 firsts. You have three 2021 seconds and a couple of 2021 thirds and then a bunch of 2022 first. So this team is just like, it's perfect. It's the perfect build for a 2022 uh, two-year turnaround where you're going to be able to load up on some running backs and really make it competitive. It's perfect because the running back window is so small and he has the perfect player in DeAndre Swift in, in two years who's going to be like a, an elite fantasy running back. Yep. And the wide receivers he has – uh, between McLaurin, Ruggs, Rager. And then on the bench, he's got ones that I think, you know, between Nikhil Harry, McCole Hardman, Deontay Johnson, Brian Edwards, one of those guys is going to hit and be a top 15, top 20 option as well. So by the time all these young wide receivers hit their prime, you'll have the picks to get those top running backs in the rookie draft and your team will kind of complete itself. I don't think there's yeah. like a lot of work that you really have to do here other than like sit and uh, sit and, and wait, be patient and be logical about how you're going to do yeah. this rebuild. He's also got Mark Andrews as well. So so the key is like you just want to land a nice quarterback in the in the next draft. Your team's probably too good to be a top pick. Actually, it's probably gonna be a middle of the pack. So hopefully you have uh, one of the picks of the other guys, or just or just kind of move. What are up your thoughts on what are your thoughts on having a roster like this and throwing games? Uh, that's Not weak. A Not a fan. That's weak. Um, I mean, he if you have Will potential- Fuller, so he doesn't have to completely throw it. <laughs> and he'll sit if for you- him. If you have potential points scored, like it's not going to work because your team's kind of like too good to be uh, middle of the pack. But you don't want to like be unloading a, a bunch of stuff here. What I will say is you should unload Will Fuller because one, he's he's kind of like you know made of glass anyway, so you don't really want that kind of injury prone guy on your roster. Um, but two, like people have the view that he could be like you know a big step up now because you know DeAndre Hopkins is gone, so you could probably sell Will Fuller in season for like a second once he has like a couple couple big games damian harris i would probably unload uh to whoever whoever the michelle owner is um and then with guys like rashad penny and devonta freeman you're kind of just waiting for news you know the second that they say oh penny's looking like his old self so uh the second that is, 
Yeah, the, the second that they Penny say... Penny expected to be ready by week one. <laughs> yeah. so, or Penny expected to be good to go by early season. So, right? Like Devontae... Or like, oh, so-and-so is looking at Devontae Freeman as a potential interest. Get a third, a third round pick. So these are the types of guys where you just want to kind of take them off your roster. Like Kyle Rudolph, anyone that needs a tight end, get a third if you can. Fuck, I mean, get a fourth even. I'll take, I'll take a couple of fourths for uh, someone like Kyle Rudolph as well. Yeah, I like the fuller, fuller pick. I that definitely, like definitely. week four, sell him because people are going to think he's the wide receiver one in that offense, and he probably is, but he's a wide receiver one in that offense for like 20% of the games, and then he's going to be like the IR one on that offense for the rest yeah. of the season. You'll so. find someone who still believes in Will Fuller. Yeah, yeah. no, probably yeah. be me. So <laughs> the, the, the only thing I will say, the only mistake you can make with this team is fooling yourself into thinking midseason, like, oh, like I'm kind of on track for playoffs. Maybe I should use one of my 2021 first. Maybe I should use one of my 2022 first to get a Le'Veon Bell, a Chris Carson, because I'm missing that one player to potentially get into the playoffs. When you're about to do that, just fucking close the app and leave and just don't think about it anymore because that is the only mistake that you can make to fuck this rebuild up. Yeah, you got to trust the process. This isn't one that, like, even if you strike strike hot, right, and your team does do well, like, you have no depth. If Will Fuller, if and when Will Fuller gets hurt, you don't have anybody really to replace him that you can trust this year. Um, even if like Mark Andrews goes down or DeAndre Swift, you don't have any type of depth. So as Nick and Mike both harped on, like you are set up perfectly to just follow the flow. You have enough picks to build uh, through the draft and grab running backs. Your receivers and your quarterbacks are pretty good in two to three years. They'll all be probably elite options, either the number one or number two in their offense. Uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't tinker with this too much, but always like if you find yourself in a position to be able to acquire a ton of value, if you end up being like the one one and you want to move back because you do have two elite quarterbacks, um, then obviously go for that. But yeah, as you sit right now, there isn't much to change. Yeah, I like the team right there. I, uh, like I said, I, don't, I think it's, it's more of a patience game with that. And as most dynasty rebuilds are, that's going to be the case. You make a few smart moves and you'll be set up for a good team for a long time. Doesn't have to be tough. Things can be simple. Shout out to Animal for having a very bad team and making it very difficult to rebuild because he keeps trying to make things better and he thinks he's a contender but he's also throwing the season i don't think he actually knows that but yeah let's do the narrative michael all right hit it this week's narrative don't overreact to rookie season so if someone has a stud season don't overreact wait and buy what do you guys think about doing that? So we're talking, we're talking specifically probably second year wide receivers because second year running backs that had a stud year are basically out of reach already. So, you know, the Terry McLaurin, the Debo Samuels, the AJ Browns probably also out of reach the DK Metcalfs. Uh, I'm probably forgetting a couple, but those types of guys, are you buying high or are you saying don't overreact? What do you guys think? Uh, I'm, I'm probably not buying high. If, if I have to overpay for them, I'm probably not going to do it because um, they just, they're just so wildly – I don't even want to say overpriced because sometimes buying high works out. But for the most part, like if you had a good rookie year, it's so easy to convince yourself to saying like, oh, now I just got like a really good asset for the next 10 years. But we've seen a lot of players come in, have like strong rookie years, and then that be like their thing. You know, like even like Willie Sneed was like – 800 yards, 800 yards, 900 yards. Like, when is he going to take that next step? But if, if you have him at the age of, like, 21, you just assume that that's going to eventually happen. But not every player becomes elite because you're elite because there's not a lot of players that actually do it, you know? And uh, I, I think, like, I think selling high on, on some players that are in that position where it's, like, over – I know you guys talked about selling high on, like, A.J. Brown. It's going gonna, it's gonna to come down to context. Like if, you believe, like, if you believe in a player, like, if you believe A.J. Brown is going to be the next, like, Julio Jones or whatever – I wouldn't sell just for the sake of like winning a trade, but I do think, yeah, the second year wide receivers, I think they're just as, just as much of a coin flip to take the next step as they were to actually hit in their rookie year, you know? Yeah. I'm much more likely, and this is an obvious statement, but I'm much more likely to buy a Nikhil Harry or an Andy Isabella or JJ Arcega Whiteside at their price relative to an AJ Brown at his price or Terry McLaurin at his price. Obviously I'm not paying the same price and that's not the reason why I'm passing up on the other guys, but I think the return on investment you can get on the lower end guys that didn't produce year one is a lot better than the guys you can get in that did produce year one. Like Nick said, like you think you're getting Julio Jones out of AJ Brown, but what if just everything lined up perfectly for him in his rookie year? I'm not doubting his talent, but like he didn't have much target competition. Corey Davis isn't great. And he did greatly benefit from Ryan Tannehill coming in or Terry McLaurin, who Nick is a huge fan of, right? Like he didn't have any type of target competition. He did produce in the face of pretty terrible quarterback play, but 
you're buying them right now almost at their ceiling. I don't see their price getting a, a ton higher unless they continue to do this for the next five years. But if you're paying that price for them, uh, I don't know. I don't think that it's as easy to get a good return on him as you could with like a J.J. Arcega Whiteside, who even if he doesn't do anything this year and he puts up like four or 500 yards, you can eventually sell him next year because people expect that third year jump. And, you know, a couple of those guys that did produce year one, like a Kelvin Benjamin or Devin Funches and Jordan Matthews. Obviously, you can't pinpoint exactly, yeah, who like... from the 2019 class are going to be those guys. But there are those situations where they do have a great first or second year and then they just completely bust. So the price you're willing to pay for them, I would probably just pass up on that and get like a Calvin Ridley or somebody that we do know is very good because they've done it back to back years. Yeah, I'm going to take the other side of this. So my approach is... I think it it is risky, of course, uh, but I think there are certain things you can look at to kind of help help fade you fade through the bus a little bit. So I I like take guys like this and I put them into uh, certain buckets, right? So if they were someone that had a really good collegiate profile and they came in and you know they did pretty well in their first year and you know from an efficiency perspective, I'm more willing to like kind of buy high on those guys. So I was I was buying high on guys like DJ Moore uh, last year. Uh, for example, and this year I'll probably, you know, still buy high on someone like uh, someone like an AJ Brown. But for other guys where I had question mark coming in, but now they are now they're actually like proving a lot of those doubters wrong. Someone like Terry McLaurin, I'm buying at ADP because I think uh, like when I was looking at this, like he's like one of the ones that really split me. Right. Because I, I try and approach the game from like a numbers perspective and from a collegiate perspective, like he was just bad. Like there's really no way to actually sugarcoat how bad he was from a call a collegiate profile but what he did in the first year was also like historically good so like how do you balance like call college profile like you just ignore that and completely weigh rookie i think what we've shown is like for rookies they have to produce but they have to produce efficiently so how do you get away from guys like kelvin benjamins and stuff you look at their like yards per route run and they were like very much bottom of the league in terms of efficiency uh, but if you're producing and you're producing really efficiently which someone like terry McLaurin and adrian brown are on like a yards per route run basis uh, i'm more willing to like kind of invest and i guess buy high on those types of guys it's like i'm the only one not giving in yet <laughs> yeah um but yeah that, that's all we got for the narrative uh Hopefully you found that helpful. If you found the rebuilds helpful, back at you soon uh, next week. And uh, we'll get some content out for you guys who are uh, part of the BDG guide. So make sure you go.